Roberts. I'm a research associate with City Futures. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everyone, everyone here to uh, to this week's seminar. Uh, this is our third of the term, so we have three more after after uh, today. Uh, we have two speakers today, um, but before I do that, I, I just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge the Dajigo people. Um, we're the traditional custodians of the land, at least where some of us are meeting today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, <clears throat> a few housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Um, if you're joining us from online, if you could turn your camera off during the, and your microphone during uh, the presentations, um, that way uh, it's well, the, the just actually it's not too much of a big deal because we only have a few people here in the room today, but uh, we'd like you to do that. And um, uh, once we, you can, you're welcome to put questions into the chat at any time. Uh, Rupa will be monitoring the chat uh, as we go along. Um, and then at the end, if when we're into the Q&A, if you want to raise your hand uh, in Teams, um, feel free to, to, to jump on verbally. And I'd like just like to say thanks to Ruba really quickly. I was gone for the last two seminars, so she did uh, most of the work. So I just uh, like to thank her for that. Um, OK, so uh, for today we have um, Hazel Easthope joining us from the airport uh, to do the introductions. So I will turn it over to uh, Hazel, who's an associate professor and also the, the associate director, director of City Futures. Hazel. Thanks very much. Uh, well, it gives me um, Great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Um, I'm lucky enough to be working with them both at the moment, um, which is a pleasure. Our first speaker is Professor Michael Oswald. He's a Professor of Architectural Analytics at UNSW. He's also our Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. He has an impressive academic record, and now you're getting a boarding call, and they pause temporarily. So his impressive academic record includes stints at UCLA and Harvard, so we're very lucky to have him. Um, he also has a very interesting and diverse research background. Amongst other things, he is trained in both architecture and town planning, and he's a member of the PIA and the AIA. And he's going to speak with us uh, about his research in the field of architectural computing. After Michael, we will hear from Dr. Charlie Gillen, who's a research associate at City Futures Research Centre at UNSW. His qualifications are in human geography and his main research interests are on housing and homes. Uh, he's currently working across three ARC projects within the centre and he's going to speak with us about one of those which he's working on alongside Michael and I and we are very lucky to have him on our team. So, over to our speakers. Thank you, Hazel. Um, I'm going first, am I? Sounds yes, please. Good. I just paused myself for another boarding call. Um, please, Michael, over to you. Now, hopefully you should be um, seeing my big yellow screen at this point and be able to hear me. Loud Thank you, everyone. Yes. Good. I know many of your names in passing. You probably see my names from time to time through UNSW um, communications and missives or town halls. Um, and most of you know me for presenting information about our research performance in a school or a faculty. Um, but today I thought I'd give you a little bit of an overview of what I actually do as a researcher, because that could be a mystery to some people. Um, in fact, probably to many people. So what I'm going to do, instead of getting into deep to talk about one project in particular, I'm going to just talk you through a dozen roughly short projects to show the sort of work I do and how it's evolved over time because I'm old enough to have seen some of the techniques we use today that are easy grow from a point where they are really difficult once upon a time in the past. So quick thing, I'm going to talk about architectural computing research, and it has a lot in common with urban computing research or urban analytics. In fact, there's a couple of methods where we have a perfect overlap. Typically, the sort of thing an architectural computing researcher does is they extract information from a building or a space using various algorithms, software, or mathematical models. Often we correlate that data to human data sets. So observations of people moving, surveys of people's preference for types of spaces, human data even to do with crime rates or graffiti occurrences. 
And then once you can correlate those two, assuming you can, you can often create a model that it shows how you can predict where these events will occur or predict how people will use a space or feel in a space. So that's the kind of typical sequence I go through. And whereas many people think architectural computing surely is interested in energy or something like that. No, I'm far more interested in cognition, how we understand things, behavior, why we do things, movement, preference, what do we like about a space and why do we like it? And even things like emotions and poetics, sometimes measured using EEG, brain waves, or eye tracking. They're the sort of things I'll be talking about briefly in today's presentation. So probably one of my earliest um, pieces of work in this genre came from, it actually came out of the late 90s when I won a, uh, what was a, called a collaborative grant, which is now called a linkage grant. And it was with the, um, the Department of Public Housing, or Department of Public Works and Services for the state. And we were developing an expert system for the, Republic, uh, for the department to help them make good decisions. And the funny thing is an expert system, which was like a very primitive artificial intelligence, was a bit of a disaster. We just simply didn't have the computing power to make it work. But they became interested in one of my side projects, which led to another major grant and contract. It was about measuring neighborhood character. We started to use image segmentation software and rapid cropping of buildings so we could develop um, character data about entire suburbs or streets. And that data could be the color or texture, but more often it was about geometry. It was about dominant geometries and distributions of detail that occurred in hundreds of buildings, if not thousands of buildings in an area. We developed mathematical methods for producing models of character. And that's still something that interests me today. And I'll actually return to this in a while. And there across the top, you can see our work on suburban character. Underneath that, the other thing we're trying to do is work out how to make sense of all the noise that's in the world, that's in the built environment. The noise is the randomness. And we developed a manifold learning technique, which is a bit like an early machine learning technique. And we fed it jumbled pictures of real buildings. And we tried to use the software to reconstruct them to make sense of them. And on the left, you can see a townhouse that it's reconstructed moderately successfully. But on the right, you can see the mangled mess it made of the Sydney Opera House, really not knowing quite what to make of this complex building. And that really exposed the limits of the methods we were using. From that sort of work, I moved on to do a whole series of projects about fractal dimensions of buildings. Now, fractal dimension is a mathematical measure of the complexity of a building. And I developed some of the early techniques actually in the early 90s to mathematically extract silhouettes of cities so we could measure the character and compare the character of different skylines. I then developed that into a whole technique for extracting fractal dimensions from houses generally. Extract the elevations and plans, overlay a series of mathematical grids, and through a complex math well, through a simple mathematical comparison, construct a mathematical measure of the complexity of that building, which allows us to compare those projects with others. The largest project I undertook using fractal dimension analysis was actually for the Istanbul Directorate of Foundations. Um, a brave thing that they appointed an Australian academic to lead a complex survey and analysis of three mosques in Turkey in Istanbul by the great architect Mimar Sinan. We actually had point cloud scans with hundreds of millions of pieces of data and we extracted them into layers of millions of pieces of data and calculated fractal dimensions of each of those layers to try and develop a rich mathematical picture of the structure of those buildings, how they could be compared with each other and how we maybe could restore them over time if they became damaged. And that sort of work with heritage buildings and the mathematics of them has continued throughout my career. As another example, working with a very talented postdoc, um, Ron Ron Yu, we started to extract geometric properties from Chinese traditional gardens, often many hundreds of years old. These gardens are quite famous for their rich complexity, for the mystery and the feelings of joy and getting lost in them. We extracted that mathematically using a range of techniques, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And then we scripted 
ways to generate new gardens that had the same techniques using Grasshopper and parametric software. And so in this simple example, we show an extraction across the top of various properties. We show the, the, the spaghetti diagram, we used to call them, of all the mathematical connections between every part. And then we can generate new gardens like the one in the isometric on the right center down below, which is a new garden that has the same mathematical properties. And we generated a whole sequence of these for different size blocks and different locations. That was a really great way to take that initial analysis and modeling through to a production of something. For quite a few years though, I've been working with a method which some of you will know called space syntax and with versions of it, some, some well known, some less so. Um, I did a whole series of projects using a range of syntactical techniques. So space syntax in a nutshell uses graph mathematics to compare the relationships between different rooms or different streets or different spaces. And the mathematics allows you to predict things like where people will be most likely to meet or least likely to meet, where people will be most overlooked or least overlooked. And you can start to correlate those human behaviors to things like crime or graffiti or neglect, or places where people will want to gather and, and connect to one another socially. And it's often used in social isolation studies or sometimes used in social isolation studies. So it's just a couple of examples from the top. I'm working with my colleagues, um, Zhu Hun Lee, who's at UNSW, and our colleague Hyun Su Lee, from, uh, who's in South Korea. We looked at an analysis of various types of retail districts in Seoul in Korea, and the ones that were most lively and the ones that were most had the highest property values and how that might or might not correlate with the mathematical properties of those streets as networks. Those, those properties determine where people are most likely to connect, which might be where they're most likely to shop. It's a bit more complex than that, but that's the sort of work we would do at the time. And the bottom images, we use those similar tactics to analyze aged care housing, residential aged care, to see whether the right safety principles were in place. So the ones on the right at the bottom show view positions for security, for nurses, for visitors, and for um, residents how they would experience views of the place and how they would see key elements of it. And on the right, we've got a visibility graph analysis of a series of residential aged care plans showing the most exposed and the most private parts of those plans. And sometimes these are surprising because you might think the most exposed part is the dining room or is the living room, but sometimes it isn't. It's literally the door to someone's room. <coughs> so. Understanding that helps us improve the design of those spaces. Now, for quite a long time, I used the same technique, which you'll see across the top, with several major developers and also working on SEP65 projects for local and state government to help us improve the design of, um, of apartment buildings. We can actually do some mathematical testing to test which apartment buildings comply with legislation, but also which are highly exposed, which are likely to have social interaction and which aren't. And so they're the sort of maps we do at the top, most of which I might add are never published, they're commercial in confident, confidence. But that helps architects improve those aspects of design. And down the bottom, you'll see one of our spatial analyses of navigation potential. It's called intelligibility, how easy it is to find your way around an urban space or an architectural space. And that's a, an extraction of key intersections, of key movement paths and their probabilities in three dimensions. And that allows us to produce a really rich map of, in this case, a building that people famously find difficult to navigate and to understand why it is like that. Now I talked about correlations between mathematics and people. I've of course done quite a few of these studies myself and I earned two IRC grants to improve pedestrian modeling software, um, 2008 and 2010 from memory. And what you're seeing in the bottom right drawing, which is a series of people walking through a public space and their view cones and their speed of movement. That's not actually a simulation we put cameras in public spaces and we recorded actual people's movements and we tracked them over long periods of time. 
They're all anonymised. We had full ethics clearance and it took about a year to get approval to put cameras in public spaces. But by the end of each monitoring period, we had millions of data points. We we're able to produce a different sort of um, robot or a different sort of pedestrian for a simulated world that didn't just run from a fire exit to the, egg, to the next one or run from a point in a concert hall to the exit or from one train to a bus, but in fact really did simulate what people do in public spaces, which includes sitting in the sun, talking to others, interacting. And so we created almost a messy algorithm that replicated real life rather than directed pedestrian movement. And we applied that in a whole bunch of spaces and it actually earned us several major contracts, which of course I can't talk about because the developers and the people involved generally don't want us to, but I'll show a little bit of one in a second. Now that's a, quite a large scale. We did a lot of these um, pedestrian simulations and we then programmed bots, agents, to, to replicate those random movements as well as director movements. And we then applied them a range of real cases. For example, this one done with a very clever Turkish student I was working with um, was about indoor queuing behavior in major gallery spaces and exhibition halls, and also how that related to fire regress. So we wrote a fuzzy inference engine, a sort of piece of software that randomized slightly the pure mathematical models for how people would move because we know people don't move in pure mathematical lines. Instead, they follow all sorts of random whims. They won't always look at the artwork in order, they might do it in reverse. So we're able to develop these simulations of how it should work in a gallery. And at the top right, we then monitored how people actually use space in the gallery. So we could validate large parts of our model and refine the software for the parts that didn't work. And that became a really valuable sort of thing to do. Um, it showed to a certain extent our fuzzy inference model of pedestrian movement was really effective in a controlled environment. Now it's that sort of work that got us several more linkage grants, including a series of two with Lend, Lease and Civil and Civic. Now, disclaimer first, none of those pictures on this slide are from that work because I wasn't allowed to show any. One of those fun things about working with industry. One of the major things we did for industry is we looked at um, modeling the behavior of retail customers in shopping malls, modeling their preferences as well. And then we combined them to see how they would use different parts of a mall. Would they experience all aspects of it on their way to the food hall or to the key anchors of tenancies like Coles or Woolworths? We did this work for Rouse Hill and several other projects, and we presented an analysis to shape the design in the first place or how it could evolve and change. Continuing to talk about movement, because we couldn't publish a lot of our findings, what we would do is my little team would then apply them to famous test cases. So this is Frank Lloyd Wright's Hollyhock House that people have written first-hand descriptions of movement through that building. And they talk about being drawn in a certain way and feeling certain emotions. Every step along the path, which is the top right image, we can chart the changing experience of the space. And we can even overlay EEG and other data to see if those accounts are more universal or if they're just particular to an individual. And in a parallel way, another project with a, that similar connection between space and emotion, working with another very clever postgrad student, Wen Zi Huang Fu, he wrote some amazing software that would determine the feeling of enclosure or exposure from a point in space in a plan. So any point in plan, we could feel overly exposed, we could feel overly overlooked, or could we feel overly enclosed? And those feelings are often tied to what we call prospect and refuge, feelings of safety and security or of opportunity in the world. But they're often not mathematically modeled. So Wednesday and I were able to produce one of the first mathematical models that captured this, what we call visual asymmetry. And it, we also use parametric software. And we applied it in the famous Moller house, Adolf Luce's house, that was designed around the idea of being exposed or being a performer in space. More recently, working with my colleague Zhu Hun Lee, we've been using slightly more advanced techniques than just mathematical modeling. We have our own mobile EEG recorder, and those are our pictures or captures of brain scans at the top from our equipment. 
um, undertaken by our colleague and assistant Samanay. Across the bottom, we've been using eye tracking to develop attractive strength measures for various parts of buildings. Are we attracted to finding the door or are we misled by a building design? Now, those are the sort of techniques we're overlaying on all those things I've been talking about for the past 50, 15 minutes to get not just the geometry of a space or its mathematical correlation to human movement, but how it connects to emotions. And it's just one tiny example of recent work that's been published in multiple places. I was part of a team that developed a really unique approach to dementia design evaluation. So working with a top specialist from Wollongong, Richard Fleming, one of my former PhD students who's now a top researcher in dementia design in the UK, and with myself as a computer expert in the team, we developed a method for um, predicting the dementia design appropriateness of a range of architectural plans to produce a tool to support the improvement of these residential aged care designs. That's been published somewhat controversially once or twice. It's led to so many, so much interest and uh, invitations from the uh, from that industry. Now, after about 20 minutes, that is pretty much the end of me. Some people are wondering what I'm currently doing, and Hazel mentioned one of these. I'm very lucky at the moment to have four major grants, two of them just starting, and that'll be keeping me busy for the next couple of years at the very least. I also wanted to mention over to one side, every bit of that work I've just shown you was done in a small team. I've been lucky to work with some amazing people. So that is my presentation, and I'm very happy to answer some questions either now or later. I'm hoping you can now see me again. Can I jump in with a question? Absolutely. All right. Um, Michael, that was wonderful. I've been looking forward to this presentation for ages to hear more about what you've been doing. Um, so thank you. Uh, I was interested that obviously you have developer partners who are actively using the outcomes of your research, but I'm interested in whether you think or how much appetite you think there is in government departments for using research like this to inform um, improvements to design guidelines. It's a good question. Um, it's a hard sell as a research tool, and I suppose much of what I'm talking about is developing new knowledge. And I find government departments often want an answer in a set time frame, and I have to say, so did Lend, Lease, Civil and Civic and all those groups. Um, and research doesn't always work like that. And not every one of those algorithms I showed you worked well. Some of them were a bit of a disaster. But the more reliable ones, I was able to convince local and state government to allow me to do that analysis. In fact, quite a lot. I did several hundred analyses of new buildings, um, measuring them against mathematical properties and universal values and state environment planning policies. And as long as I could turn around an answer in under a week for every one of them, I had constant return business. So that was really good in one perspective, one sense. But of course, it's not developing new knowledge. It's translating the knowledge that I've developed in other projects into a sort of an impact. And that takes a, a bit of a shift in mindset. It, it does become a much more of a consultancy exercise in a sense, but um, the impacts are, can be huge. And I think that's why it's worth considering both these paths, the pure research path and the kind of translational path. Thanks very much. Yes, Bruce. Hi. Um, I preface my question by saying I don't know nothing about architecture. Um, but I am interested in artificial intelligence applications. Uh, so I'm interested in your your views on how interpretable the findings are. So if your model, for example, says a building rates well on some particular criteria, are you able to understand why it comes to that rating, or are these generally sort of black box type conclusions that you don't you can't understand? Okay, the methods are variable. Some of them are black boxy, but most aren't. But what they will do is they will tell you what, how a building will work, all things being equal, provided you don't. Um, one of my favourite examples is you can measure the building mathematically and it assumes that every surface is white and equal. It assumes that um, there's no noise coming 
differentially from somewhere that the lift shaft doesn't smell or the garbage chute doesn't smell. Once those factors come in, though, the mathematical model becomes really difficult, if not impossible. So what we can do is get some good understanding about an ideal world simulation of a floor plan or a building or a, or a public space. But beyond that, you change the space or you change the building every time you interact with it. If you put a, a bench seat into a corridor, it will change the social dynamic. We can partially measure that, but not incredibly well. And it's that sort of gap between understanding the ideal mathematical world and the real world that takes a bit of interpretation and sensitivity. Great. Um, it looks like we maybe we have one more question in the chat. I don't know. If, can you check that? Yes, I've just seen a question in the chat from oh, Elizabeth. Great. great. Mm. When observing people, did you see many complete outliers where behaviour left you? Absolutely. And that's so one of the things when you do this type of research. Um, it doesn't, it's never good at predicting the outliers, really. It doesn't predict the person who has no clue where they're going, but is happy to walk in circles. It, what it does is it sort of uses a big data approach. It says if we look at enough thousands of people, we will start to get the pattern. And there will be outliers, and we can even do a sort of fuzzy inference modelling of what the outliers might do. But it's never accurate in that sense. But it's nice to know that there are, are outliers because they're the ones that the old pedestrian software ignored completely. And when we published our versions, uh, we got a lot of interest in that sort of randomness of behavior um, or undirected behavior or non-directed behavior. Um, so definitely that happens. And if you're gonna, only going to observe a small number of people, you're not gonna get a good answer. So with these sort of methods, it is a bigger scale for a lot of them. Great. And Riz has asked, are these methods able to be used during the construction stage to improve health and safety? There are some definitely, and there's a lot of visibility analysis and in um, and uh, what we call it collision detection analysis in some of this software, in some of these models. Now, I would think that that might be applicable in construction, but I think the other side of that one though is construction environments are often really complex. There's a lot happening in three dimensions. There's a lot of sound distracting people. And I, I think, I worry that that would undermine the validity of some of these methods in a construction environment because there's so many other things going on. I'd have to think that through. Good question, Riza. And good, good comment, Paul. Yes. <laughs> uh, any questions in the room? Um, anything, anybody else online have another question? Otherwise, we can. Uh, switch over to Charlie and maybe we'll have a, some time for a shared Q&A at the end if there are crossover questions. So um, so thanks very much, Michael. That was great. And Charlie, we'll I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Lee. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Just let me know in the room if you can see it. Yes. Good. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Yep, all good. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks, Hazel, for the introduction. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge that I'm joining the call today from Dharawal country in Wollongong, um, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations people on the call today. All the photos in this presentation were taken on Dharawal in Wollongong CBD, which is undergoing rapid densification and high rise development activity. It's worth saying, though, that all these photos are illustrative only, and I'm not making an assessment on the quality of any buildings photographed or anything like that, as that is part of what I'm going to be speaking about today. So um, what I'm going to talk about is rebuilding trust in the apartment market. Um, we are probably all aware um, about high profile cases of combustible cladding and structural failure in high rise apartments in Australia and elsewhere. Um, the consequences of building defects in high rise apartments are severe um, for investment for investors and apartment owners. It's about losing their investments, their homes, potentially their life savings. Um, for professionals related to indemnity insurance costs, leaving professionals exposed to risk and hamstrung to take certain contracts. Um, governments, of course, will need to devote costs to fixing high level defects. Um, a current example being the Project Remediate Scheme in New South Wales, a program that's supporting remediation works for flammable cladding in class two residential apartment buildings. So how can trust be rebuilt? Um, there are a few things that are in the works. 
I've greyed out the first stop point because that's not the focus of the project that I'm going to speak about today, but of course is crucial in this space, more effective compliance and enforcement, which is really covered uh, the recommendations as outlined in the Shergold and Weir report. Um, what I'm going to talk about is professional values and ethics and the role of professions in lifting standards and rebuilding trust. What this project is looking at, which I'll speak about in more detail in a second, is improving professionalism and ethical conduct. Um, and also working towards a fuller understanding of how professions in the building and construction system work together. Of course, professionals aren't working in silos. Um, they're working on projects together and their interactions have consequences in terms of the built product um, and the process and ways that we can make things more reliable and trustworthy. This presentation is going to focus on initial findings of research that explores the intersection between professional values, professional ethics, and regulatory frameworks of one profession in the building sector, which is architects. Um, the quote that I've got on this slide is a bit indicative of some of the things that we're starting to explore and a bit of a taster of the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about later in the presentation is really about the role of each professional in this system um, and different components towards the delivery of high rise apartments um, and the position of different professionals in, in that system. So the project uh, is an ARC linkage project um, which started midway through last year and its title is Constructing Building Integrity. Um, the broad goal of the project is to investigate the role of professions in rebuilding trust in the residential building construction in Australia. Um, it's an interdisciplinary research team which is to its strength. We have lawyers, built environment researchers and social scientists as part of the team as well as ethicists. Um, the research team comes from four different institutions, Griffith, Curtin, UNSW and Torrens. I see a couple of names of other research project members on the call, so um, thanks for coming along and hearing this this afternoon. The partner organisations in this linkage are the Professional Standards Council as a meta regulator of the professions, uh, a couple of state regulators, one in Western Australia and one in Queensland, uh, and a major legal firm, Cause Chambers Westgarth. The scope of the project is professionals and paraprofessionals that are working within the construction of residential developments of over four stories. The focus here is because this is where the most spectacular problems have emerged and at the point where home warranty insurance diverges. The nine professionals and paraprofessionals that we're looking at as a collective are building surveyors, engineers, architects, building designers, landscape architects, property and land valuers, town planners, builders and contractors and managers. Um, we're looking at this conceptually as a value chain, so considering the end to end of a class two apartment building. By that, I mean from the strategic definition when the project begins, it's sort of um, beginning stages of how it's going to be designed and built to its in use stage where you've got owners and residents in the buildings um, using them and their sort of continued life once completed. The jurisdictional focus of the project is across four states, partly due to the uh, but where the research is based, but also partly due to the expertise that's in the team, uh, New South Wales, Western Australia, Queensland and Victoria. In terms of the contribution from UNSW, um, as Hazel and Michael have already indicated, um, they are on this project. Um, we are looking at architects and managers. Uh, architects are the focus of today's presentation, but it's also worth saying that we're working on when we when we talk about managers, we're referring to strata managers, building managers and facilities managers. Um, thinking just briefly on managers, um, some of the things that come to mind in this space are management contracts um, and relationships with developers, suppliers and providers of strata services, uh, their role of strata managers in defects rectification. Um, and that interface that managers play with consumer owners and renters um, in the ongoing life of a building. So just briefly on the methods for the project, um, the project and the team, and there's roughly 16 researchers from memory on this project at the moment, we're looking at conducting 100 interviews or more um, with individuals that are representing each of those nine professions. 
when we say individuals representing each of the professions, they may be involved in their professional capacity in a number of different ways. They may represent peak regulators, peak member organizations, um, or have a different role in the, um, the conduct of that professional. The interesting thing and the most compelling thing for building a more comprehensive sense of what's going on is we're using the same question set for all professionals. So in doing so, we're able to sort of see the convergences and divergences across the sample and ways that we can sort of see synergies and, and places of opportunity for um, making reform happen in this space. There's a couple of other methods that are going on that are sort of in their early stages. At different points in the project, we're bringing together a number of professionals uh, to have cross-profession workshops, um, also with academics to focus on specific issues and themes. Um, and a third method, which will come in shortly, about the modeling of interview data. So using qualitative data to identify different variables um, through something called Bayesian network analysis, uh, which identifies variables um, and then maps and graphs the causal factors behind decisions. So we can start to see those pinch points um, in, in the mapping of qualitative data, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> We're starting at the moment as individual teams working on our individual professions and then bringing all of this information together over the next couple of years. So as I said, I'd like to focus today on what we found so far with architects, and I'm just briefly going to talk about the frameworks that guide professionalism for architects, some of the ethical dilemmas that are highlighted in work in this space that already exists, and then I'll go into a focus on some of the interviews uh, and interview material that we've got to date. So this is a brief simplified overview of what guides the navigation of ethical dilemmas in a regulatory sense for architects and also highlights the supporting role that membership organizations and peak bodies play in the monitoring of professionals. Um, when we talk about architects in Australia, there are typically two types legally registered architects and graduate architects who have completed part of those requirements for registration. The former has the legal right to be called an architect, whereas the latter doesn't, even though both will be often considered as architects. ARBs or architects registration boards are the statutory bodies responsible for legally registering architects and also administer the state based acts for the profession. So you'll see for the jurisdictions that we're focusing on, uh, New South Wales, ARB, the Board of Architects of Queensland, the ARB of Victoria, and the Architects Board of Western Australia. Collectively, these registration boards own the Accreditation Council. Um, this is the body that administers the National Standard of Competency for Architects and also the Architectural Practice Examination, um, both of which are core requirements of the knowledge and skills required to register as an architect. Um, the Royal Australian Institute of Architects, which I'm uh, referring to as the AIA, is the peak member-based association for the architecture profession in Australia. The AIA operates at a national scale with chapters in each state, and there are three member classes for architects, for graduates, and for students. As you'll see on the slide, codes of practice or conduct are used to set expectations of ethical and professional practice for architects. Codes of ethics and conduct are adopted in three of the four project study locations, as you'll see, for New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. Um, in Western Australia, they have a provision for the code, um, but there's no code adopted. The National Peak Industry for Architects, the AIA, has a code of professional conduct for its members. Just briefly on these documents, the vision statement and mission statements or goals for ARBs really focus on professional obligations and protections for the client and consumers. Um, the, strateg the strategic priorities are really about advancing the profession and advocating for the role of architects. The ARB codes are mandatory statutory, statutory codes for architects and are enforceable, and there are complaints processes attached to these for consumers. Um, failure to comply can constitute unsatisfactory professional conduct or professional misconduct. For the AIA, the code is a broader commitment to a public good. Um, the tagline is that good design adds value, uh, and the document itself has references to broader responsibilities uh, around environmental and social aspirations. The code is structured around four principles, obligations to the public, obligations to the client, to the profession, and to colleagues. Of course, a fundamental difference 
in influence of both of these codes groups is that architects are held to the registration board codes in a statutory sense, but you're only held to the AAA code if you are a member. Just briefly on the literature review that we've done to date on the project, I've tried to isolate three ethical dilemmas in the literature that come up for architects. The first, um, who is the ultimate client? So there's a tension between the client contract and the social contract. In this case, developers as clients and residents and owners and society more broadly um, referring to the social contract. Here, there's a tension between the public benefits and outcomes um, and the demands of the commercial client and the, the outcomes of those. Second, the values, which values guide outcomes. There's a tension that's long existed in architectural literature around aesthetics or ethics. Um, design outcomes, so the, the design that the architect envisions, is that the most important thing? Or is it in fact the use outcomes? So the end result of the building, um, how is that being used? How, is it, um, how does it exist over time? Um, those sorts of things about safety and, and considerations like that. Um, in terms of values, there's an expanded remit of responsibility, not only for architects, but also for all urban practitioners around things like social responsibility, environmental responsibility. So this is really coming to the fore. Uh, one, one very public way that architects have done that is the Architects Declare movement and other built environment professionals have done a similar thing, but these are certainly uh, on the radar of architects at the moment. The last thing which is really interesting in this space is the role of the architect. There are two sort of things happening here. One is the diminishing of architects' roles in projects in terms of project scope, so what they're able to see across a project, but also project control. Traditionally, architects were the sort of key component in a building project. This has diminished over time as the way of development contracts coming together has shifted. Um, the second thing in terms of the role of the architect is that while there's this sort of confusion around where architects sit in projects, there's also increasing regulation and individualization of risk for architects. Of course, this risk individualization exists for other built environment professionals, but in this case, it's, it's things around compliance, um, meeting paper trails, um, as, as Emory and Street call them. And just briefly, um, in the space around ethical dilemmas, there's a lot of, I guess, what you'd call textbook style guidance that's pitched at architects as students. Um, Thomas Fisher is a leading author in this space and really works on applied ethics. Um, and this book, 50 Dilemmas of Professional Practice, is a key text and one that our interviewees have referred to in, in a couple of places around how to sort of enact what's happening in this space and, and make eth ethics live um, in a project sense. I just got this quote up here. Um, this is part of the conclusion of the book, but it really speaks to the importance of ethics in the, the outcome of buildings. And I think the role potentially that Fisher sees for where ethics um, and architects, the, the way that architects perform in the space and their ethical guideline, um, you know, the, the outcomes of that are, uh, something that architects can really lead um, in the space at the moment. With the time I've got left, I'd just like to briefly show some illustrative quotes that represent early insights from the interviews that we've done to date. To quickly recap, um, for architects, we've interviewed practicing architects, principal architects, and what we've called pracademics, so practicing architects that also play a role in education, so whether that's at, at university or within different um, regulatory bodies or competency bodies. Um, we've identified people uh, that have served in the past on registration boards, have served with the AIA or the Accreditation Council, and we've interviewed at least one architect from each state that's part of the project. We've also sought to have a balance of gender and experience, um, and yeah, what I'd like to show is just some illustrative quotes for themes that are emerging from interviews that we're starting to think about um, towards increasing professionalism through conduct and ethics and the regulation that, um, that sort of guides that practice. So first off, 
what's very clear from the people we've spoken to is that there's a really strong sense of public responsibility from architects. Um, there's a couple of indicative quotes up here around public safety and the responsibility of the architect to keep the public safe as sort of the, the core tenet of, of what architects should be doing. One of the things that is coming out of interviews at the moment is that it's unclear about what the public good can mean. There's a bit of um, there's a bit of, I guess, choice around where energies can be filtered. So the second quote on this slide refers to public good through an environmental lens and really focusing on sustainability. The second thing that they're considering is around social housing and sustainability um, at sort of seen through a social lens. So there's a bit of nuance around the way that public good can be framed for architects. This is perhaps a bit different from other professions like doctors, um, where do no harm is the public good that sort of um, comes to mind instantly. There's a bit of there's a bit of uh, nuance around the public good in this space. What's quite interesting is that while there's a really strong sense of public responsibility, there's an unclear public perception. Um, architects were asked about how the public views their profession and if they're seen as ethical and trustworthy. And one of the things that's come out quite strongly um, is that the general public is a bit unaware of what architects can do and what ar architects will do, the kind of work that they'll do and work that they'd be engaged to do. So, of course, this impacts the social license of architects to operate, thinking around here that architects are expensive and they design bespoke things. and this is quite interesting in the space because um, it limits the scope of architects and the role that they're seen to play in building projects. One of the things that has come out that may be a bit of an intervention into this insight is that several architects were in favour of really increasing the public commentary and advocacy that architects can play as experts in the built environment, highlighting the range of architects, the, the range of work that they do in terms of uh, potentially building schools or social housing and other sorts of interventions that they're making in a public sector fashion and how that expertise can be better utilized in the space. Another insight is related to the changing hierarchy and scope that architects are experiencing. As I said, traditionally, the role of the architect was to lead a design project and sort of orchestrate the built outcome. Now there's a lot of professions working in the same space and there's tension in the duties that each profession plays. So you'll see on the slide, there's a couple of things that I'd like to refer to. First, the first quote refers to the consulting hierarchy and the different ways that uh, sort of project based or client based that consultants and sub consultants sit in a project. You'll see here that the, the person who's speaking is talking about slipping further down the chain, so sort of losing that traditional orchestration role. Um, and it becomes quite difficult to share skill set, but also demonstrate value um, in their perspective. The second thing is what this um, architect has referred to as a turf war between developer led and architect led projects. And I think this is particularly important when thinking about multi um, multi unit apartment buildings and the kinds of things that are going on in the market. It's it's quite interesting thinking about the maybe the way that the public may perceive the architect is in control of one of these projects when in fact their role and their scope is quite diminished in this space. It's also interesting in the broader project that a lot of these professionals are working within the same companies. So large construction companies will have engineers, architects, developers, project managers, and so on. And one of the things that this project wants to do in the next couple of in the next couple of years is really start to think about how that that dynamic works within large companies um, and the professionals that sit within. Related to this change in scope is competitive market pressures. So this, of course, is is not news to the people on the call today that there's a lot of competition in the market at the moment. Um, now architects as one of one of multiple subcontractors, there's some interesting things happening for architects that we spoke to around the pressure of the operating environment and competition for jobs. And in this space, um, the building relationships between developers and contractors is one source of conflict of interest. This quote also identifies some strategies that architects may use to 
um, to obtain work in a competitive marketplace that may be considered a conflict of interest. So fee cutting, um, favoring different procurement methods with an eye towards not only current work, but also future work. And something else related to this sense of competitive markets is how people navigate them. So the documents that they use. And of course, one of the things that's really a key component of this project is what's written. So those those written documents that help navigate competitive markets and help navigate professional conduct. What we found so far is that while codes are sort of seen, I suppose, as an ethical baseline or a foundational point of reference, um, the codes are also part of that demonstrated competency of registering as an architect, but they're not viewed as important day to day reference documents. They're not used in a daily sense. What's happening is that there's a primary source of written guidance, um, which is the client architect agreement that sets out the terms of engagement, the roles and the responsibilities of architects in the space. These bake in the client protections and guidelines and and really speak to what's immediately in front of the architect, which is the contract that they're working on. This quote here is just giving a bit of a sense of the kinds of downward pressures on architects at the moment. So here there are you know, things that we're, we're all familiar with, but in terms of competing for jobs, um, buildings are going bankrupt, uh, building companies, and clients are pulling out of projects. So there's a lot of downward pressure, and this architect here is sort of saying that you know, the, the professional codes may be sort of seen as a, a bit of a luxury when the bottom line is the most important thing, the most thing, the thing that's most front of mind. Um, the last thing I'd like to raise from the interviews um, is in terms of risk and compliance and changing regulation, um, there's a level of overwhelm that's happening for architects in the space. Um, this architect here is referring to fire safety, egress, access, plumbing codes, and really shows that you know this this load of what's happening is affecting practice and affecting where architects may be looking and their priorities, uh, the way that they're working. Um, I think the end of this quote is quite interesting and a, and a good place to sort of leave the interview insights at the moment. That if we continue down this path of increased compliance, um, there's no almost no options but bad choices in the way that we practice. Of course, compliance requirements are very much on the agenda in New South Wales with the um, the introduction of the Design and Building Practitioners Act and seeing professionals, uh, so building designers and architects falling underneath that, the way that they're navigating that new legislation and uh, some of the problems that arise and some of the dilemmas when you're testing new legislation um, in this space. So that's just a bit of a summary of, of what we found so far, and really we're seeing these as sort of places that we might focus attention, uh, whether that's in regulation and governance mechanisms, um, new avenues for architects, such as that public expert and advocacy role that architects could play, but also identifying tensions and pinch points for the broader sector. So the interaction between professionals on large construction projects, the position of architects um, and how that expertise is used. Just to finish up, I just wanted to sort of give a bit of a nod to the so what, the what's next for this project. So one of the ultimate goals of this project is developing what our chief investigators, um, Charles Sanford and Hugh Brakey refer to as an integrity system. So this is an approach that they've used in the past for businesses um, and also in the judicial system. Uh, where we want to translate all the challenges and opportunities across these nine professions that are analysed, um, find challenges and opportunities and identify weaknesses and places where there may be effective intervention, um, whether that's through reform, um, application in reg regulatory bodies, in membership bodies, in companies, as individual companies. Here you'll see that you know, an integrity system is really focusing on ways to facilitate integrity, but also remove those opportunities for corruption. Just as a bit of a nod to where we're up to in the project and what's next, sort of approaching the end of that individual focus for each research team on individual professions. In 2023 and 2024, we're really focusing on bringing all that work together and seeing how the interactions between and within professions can help bring about effective reform in the space. And that's the end of the presentation. So thanks for thanks for sticking around on Friday afternoon. And um, yeah, I'd welcome questions and 
I've also got Hazel and Michael on the call, so they may be able to uh, direct, you may be able to direct questions to the subject matter experts on that as well. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Um, can see you very well, but um, that's great. Uh, any questions from online or in the room? Maybe I'll, I'll start with one. Um, I was I was curious, I, so I went through architecture education and practiced as an architect for a while before switching <coughs> careers, but one of the things that's that's always striking about architectural education is that it's, it's still a sort of positioning architects in that master controlling role and I think we don't we don't so I'm going to try to get on screen <laughs> there <I am. laughs> uh, we, we, we don't really get very much practice in school in the in the kind of new collaborative uh, roles that that I think are, are really critical to good practice um, so I'm just wondering I mean maybe this is something that will come out of this project is looking at ways that education architectural education can change um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've we've spoken to a, a couple of what I what I said, academics in the space, and they were really, I mean, one of the reasons that they were identified was because they were um, identified for their role in ethical education. So of course they they knew what they were talking about. But the the interesting thing in that space is that the I guess the the student population weren't as ready for an applied sense of ethics um as you say there's um there's this sort of i guess romantic idea of architects sort of sitting and designing and um in fact you know the way that the the contract research uh contract consulting has changed has sort of put architects in an interesting space so i think that's one of the things <clears throat> that we're seeing is attention for the profession um and when we start to think about the ways that different professions are interacting, it will be cool to see, I guess, what other professions think of architects and their and the way that they negotiate contracts with alongside architects. I think that would be something that maybe we could explore further. Uh, looks like somebody in the oh, one in the one in the room. We'll start with the room. Live to the camera. Sure. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, Charlie. Peter Hunt here. Um, oh, hi. <laughs> I agree with everything that you said, and um, it sort of ties in with some of my PhD research, which I've now finished. Um, I suppose I can see, and I think you've articulated, but I think there's this shift in what the architectural, um, or what the architect sort of brings to the equation in property development these days. Um, and I think that shift comes from um being diminished in the i suppose project delivery sort of stage side of things but the other thing i think there's a great opportunity and you sort of mentioned it was um for the architect to educate the clients and certainly on some of these social and um economic i mean environmental sustainability issues um mm. do you sort of see that coming out of um and do you sort of see this mental shift occurring with architects in where they sort of sit in you know the hierarchy of development if you like yeah it's 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 quite interesting i mean the the thing that i would immediately say is um that there's this real oh sorry do you mind just articulating the question again i've just lost my train of thought <laughs> no it was um do you see the architect's role changing being if you like the um yeah yeah you know, having to so. educate the clients as well as the you know working for the clients but there is really this obligation effectively in so um, certainly sustainable social sustainability and environmental sustainability mm. in building practice yeah i think what we're seeing is i guess the level of negotiation that might happen whether architects have the space to voice those things within a contract but i think that the the interesting thing that we've found so far when talking to architects is that architects need to get out there a bit more and show that expertise and that experience in this space and put themselves forward in terms of um, you know those those larger sustainability conversations that are happening in society. I think at least two or three of the people that we've spoken to have noticed a silence 
in terms of that public voice. And I think in terms of doing that, shifting the way that the public sees architects and then changing the social license and the kind of expertise that architects may sort of claw back, I suppose, in this in this space. Thanks for standing up for the question too. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It looks like we've got a, a couple of questions online. Uh, um, one's been answered, and uh, Michael Tees has Yeah, Michael, that is, that is a really interesting case for this, this project. Thanks for bringing it to our attention again. Great. And Elizabeth, did you have a question? Yes. Um, you mentioned towards the end, I think, that the regulatory focus or some architects mentioned that the regulatory focus on compliance was making it more difficult to comply with ethical requirements. Um, how does that work? I would have thought a, a compliance is a requirement for ethics. Mm. I think what the, the architect was talking about was, I guess, analysis paralysis, um, where there's sort of so much subcontracting, so much subconsulting that's going into projects and making sure you're ticking boxes for compliance that the bigger picture may be being lost. Um, so the sort of value add that architects offer to projects is perhaps um, not being given space to be expressed because I guess there's that sort of boxing of expertise. Just sort of doing the administrative burden of of projects as opposed to sort of adding those those higher order um, skills and expertise. Maybe we can talk at another time that's not five o'clock yes. on a Friday about how <laughs> how you found that with your profession too. Yes. Great. Um, so it is it is five one, but I but I know the Rupa has a question, so I'll, I'll give her the floor. Hi Charlie, really interesting presentation and some parallels. Whoop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, some parallels with my PhD research project that focused on um, real estate agents specialising in off the plan apartment sales mm -hmm. uh, and their professional expertise and role that they play in influencing development outcomes. I jotted down a couple of notes which are relevant to your project and I'll send you a separate email as well. In my research, uh, when interviewing uh, developers, real estate agencies, um, professional associations and industry lobby groups that have expertise in the sales of apartments, they mention the influence that real estate agents have on architects in adv advising on design outcomes that meet commercial reality and architect mm. architects being out of touch with um, costs and achievable prices uh, and sales rates um, of their design. So that's something that I think needs to be factored in um, when training architects, I suppose, and in their practical experience as well. So yeah. architects have to know how to manage design outcomes, but also understand commercial realities of their designs, mm -hmm. and particularly um, in certain changing market contexts. Um, the other thing that was raised is the architect working on projects may change over time. So the initial appointed architect uh, may be a flagship architect who prepares a master plan on projects, to, particularly to get the development application through and to please the um, decision-making bodies in local and state government. But then subsequently, a different architect is appointed uh, to prepare subsequent plans. So this competitiveness in the um, architect uh, arch architecture industry was actually also um, occurring in parallel with the real estate agency industry who um, are, are facing equal co competition in the industry and this uh, pressure to cut their costs, uh, it, particularly in a you know building boom when there were many um, different development actors vying um, to get a position in front of the developer to be appointed. Mm. So yeah, yeah, questions, comments, but I'll shoot you an email separately as well. Yeah, thank you, Rupa. Um, so real estate agents are one of the groups that this project is looking at as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's sort of parallels with what you found in your research as well. Um, I agree with you as well on that That sort of, I guess, star architect, um, getting that big name as the sort of flagship adding gloss to a real estate 
uh, to a development project and then perhaps not sort of seeing that through. So there's some interesting things around sort of the, the cradle to grave of a, of a project and the different points of intervention that, that architects are maybe envisioned to be playing and then actually playing in practice. Um, thanks for the question. Okay. Well, uh, it is 5.05, so I think we'll, we'll stop there. Um, thanks very much, Michael and Charlie, for those presentations, and um, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, and just a reminder that we'll have another uh, seminar in two weeks. Susan Thompson, who I see is in the audience, will be uh, presenting, so that, that'll be great uh, on parks. And uh, so invite everybody to, to come to that one as well. So thanks again, Charlie and Michael, and see you all in a couple of weeks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.